to the Minister for Education. And I call Rachel Woods to ask the first question. Ms Woods. Question one. I call Minister. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Thank the member for her question. I suppose while my department and the Education Authority has taken action over a number of years to reduce the number of amount, the amount of single-use plastic uh, in school, uh, the current pandemic has probably had uh, two particular impacts, both in terms of any, few, uh, any further work that was able to be progressed in relation to that. Uh, I suppose there's not been able to be development of that. But actually, the current pandemic has led to a greater use of disposable products in order to minimise the risk of transmission. The Education Authority recognises this issue and is conscious of the impact of single-use plastics within the school environment. The measures currently uh, being taken under the Education Restart programme, I would stress, are of a temporary and emergency nature, and the resources deployed and decisions being made in relation to school safety and reduction in risk of infection are based on the latest ongoing and continuously updated advice from the Northern Ireland Public Health Agency to minimise and eliminate the spread of COVID-19 uh, between and within uh, the home and school settings. Rachel Woods for a supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I thank the Minister for his answer. But the Minister will be aware of the increased plastic pollution that is arising from the COVID-19 pandemic. More face masks, gloves, plastic bottles, food packaging will end up in landfill or dumped in our rivers and seas. And all of this will have a devastating impact on our environment, wildlife and marine life. So in light of this, can the Minister outline what actions the Department are going to take to reduce the use of single-use plastics and promote eco-friendly alternatives, given there are so many? Look, as I said, the position is suppose, that, that there has been some action that, that has been taken. There is that level of engagement with EA uh, and schools. I think there's also a role um, which all of us can do as individuals. And so part of the complication um, we've mentioned, for example, in terms of uh, the issue of face coverings, which in terms of disposability, there's a limited amount directly can be done in connection with that. But I suppose one of the drivers in terms of use of plastics, and this is where particularly um, I think it's a critical role for parents and families within this, is that one of the, the drivers of the uh, of the inability, if you like, to reuse plastics is the fact that uh, within a COVID situation, we can't have that cross-contamination of being passed from child to child in relation to it. However, there is the opportunity, for example, if we take um, an issue of um, bottled water, to take one example, which would involve a level of packaging, um, there's nothing stopping. I would certainly encourage, for instance, parents who, if they are either supplying food or drink, uh, for example, water to bring in, that they use, for instance, a single, um, uh, some, a single sort of receptacle, uh, which can then be used multiple times by the, by the child. Because from that point of view, that what is done directly in schools, it is not almost what the individual does in terms of any risk of a multiple use of something. It is actually the cross-contamination of where that can be used um, by a number of people on it. But simple steps of that nature, which can be taken where um, Parents, for instance, can give a single container which the child can either use for what is supplied within that container or, for example, if they're accessing water um, at school, they can reuse that again. I know there are many members, indeed, in other walks of life who will, for instance, bring a single container with them, uh, particularly from a, an environmentally friendly way to be able to sort of reuse products. So it's, it's about thinking that intelligent way through. And this is where I think there needs to be a, a level of partnership between what is directly happening in schools and what parents are able to do themselves. Aaron, Sir Philip McGuigan, for your cash, I call Philip McGuigan. Karim Elgert, uh, last can call you. And, and notwithstanding the answer that the Minister gave to Ms Woods, uh, generally or specifically in relation to COVID, uh, I mean, can I ask the Minister further to uh, Ms Woods' question, you know, beyond the COVID pandemic, what advice or guidance or instruction will he give to schools to try and reduce the amount of single-use plastics in schools? Henry, there's been a lot of good work that has happened already, and I think the EA will be continuing to directly engage with schools. So it's about that level of interaction, because schools are given a high level of autonomy as to what they do, but it's got to be an encouragement about finding novel solutions. So, for example, EA have used, um, for instance, competitions, and indeed, We've worked uh, as a department, I think, with DERA in terms of highlighting um, the use of, of plastics and trying to be able to reduce that. Um, and again, I think if you can get that level of buy-in. So it's about actually schools identifying either at an individual level of the pupils through either level of competition or the schools themselves to produce those, uh, those actions to improve their own environment. I think there's also within that uh, 
there is incentivisation that EA put in place so that schools where they can reduce the amount of waste that they are produced, that that can help reduce the waste disposal costs, and that will then feed in directly into the, the budgets. And everybody knows uh, the extent to which, even in normal times, school budgets tend to get stretched. So I think we can actually find a situation that if we can reduce those levels of costs, we can get a win-win situation um, for schools. Here Sir Mark Durkin for your cash. I call Mark Durkin. Thank the Minister for his answers to Ms Wood's question and subsequent questions. It's pretty appropriate given my daughter Lily, who is six today, was re-elected onto the school's Eco Council uh, yesterday. Uh, further to an answer you'd given Ms Wood in the particular example that the Minister had used of bottles and reusable bottles, would the Minister give any consideration to funding schools to provide pupils with said reusable bottles? Look, we'll certainly look at that within any constraints of, of budget that, that, is, that is there. I think there will also be, I think there is a level of onus that's also there on, on uh, parents as well. Uh, and, and maybe I'm just slightly distracted by the nightmare vision of another generation of Durkins entering elected politics. Here I'm Sir Linda Dillon for New Cash. I call Linda Dillon. My Lash can call you Cash Deverado. Question two. Thank the member for her question. We are currently working with the PHA and the Education Authority to consider how best to provide the information in an accurate and timely way. The information that we have had uh, so far, I think, is that over the period of the last month or so, that in terms of direct inquiries to PHA, around about 180 schools have made some level of inquiry. However, I think that that can be misleading because that is something simply spread over the period of a month. But it is also the case that if an inquiry is, is getting made, it could be simply by checking something where there is somebody perhaps displaying symptoms but there is no indication of a positive case. It can be something which can impact on one particular pupil or a member of staff or it can be something much more widely. So the figures themselves will, be, will potentially be a little bit more misleading. We do have figures which um, indicate the levels of um, school attendance that have been put in place uh, that has been happened and we are able now to gather those on a weekly basis which gives us a level of tracker uh, within that. And similarly, though I think it's taken on a slightly different time frame, we also would have um, figures that relate to uh, the number of, of teachers and education staff that would be in. And I would say, um, and I'll be happy probably to follow up on those, on those issues, um, that the figures would suggest in both cases that there's a very high level of school attendance that is there. Obviously, we would anticipate that there will be some level of dip given current uh, circumstances. But it does actually show that, that Northern Ireland, for instance, compared to the figures in England and Wales, where there's been quite a large number of, of, of absences, that there's both a very strong welcome commitment uh, from education staff that want to be there directly on the front line teaching children, but also that there's been a very strong buy-in and valuation of education from parents as well. There will be a small number of children that will be in the position because of clinical vulnerability that will not be in the position to attend school, but the figures would suggest there's been a very um, high level of success in getting children directly into, into school as a result of resumption. Case Dorlinta, Glenda Dill, supplementary question. Can I thank the Minister for his answer and also can I thank the Minister for coming to St Joseph's Primary School in Galbally last week in my constituency and they did some very good work during lockdown in terms of the remote learning. Going forward obviously we have the potential for a lot more remote learning where maybe bubbles or, or full schools have to close down. And I think a lot of leeway was given to some schools that maybe didn't perform as well as St Joseph's and Galbally in terms of the remote learning process. And I think going forward we need to get some assurance from the Minister that there will be equity right across the board for young people in terms of both what they get from their school but also equity in accessing remote learning because as we know not every family has electronic devices and some families have a large number of children and maybe only one electronic device. There are very valid points uh, within that. A lot of schools rose very successfully to the challenge of remote learning, um, but it was not uniform across the piece. And I think it is difficult to enforce something which is completely uniform in terms of, in terms of that. And what indeed was found, and sometimes it will be the particular approach even from individual teachers within a school. So you may get uh, two pupils at the same school in a different class, and they may find that there's not absolute consistency throughout. What it does also highlight is that while a lot of very intelligent, innovative work was done in terms of remote learning, remote learning is, and everybody in the system will concede this, is effectively a form of second best to that direct classroom learning. That's why 
the focus has got to be in, in terms of ensuring the maximum uh, amount is within that. In terms of, uh, the member mentions in terms of devices, there's been procurement um, of devices. And I've today, for instance, tried to find out, um, again, one of the things we want to just establish is that where those are then being sourced, can we find a way in which uh, ensure that, that perhaps sometimes where maybe some parents may be a little bit shy or nervous about actually asking for a device that those can be um, uh, obtained. I think the other limitation which would be, and I'm sure the member, member for Mid Ulster will, will know this and indeed some from parts of the west of the province, is also the case that whatever we have, and while there's been some work done with, for instance, BT in terms of connectivity, there will be patches throughout Northern Ireland with the best will in the world. You could have every device in the world, but the internet connection is so poor um, that it would not necessarily lend itself to that, in which case some of those schools have had to operate by way of paper packs, which again is, is probably one step uh, removed uh, within that. Uh, there's also, I think, a need to ensure that we have particular groups within that that are identified which we can provide levels of particular support. So yesterday, for instance, I met with a group uh, who would deal with the, uh, and work and provide support for visually impaired children, and there will be different challenges that will be there. And there will be around uh, a number of issues, particular challenges, but the main aim must be to get the maximum number of children directly into class. I call Alan Chambers. Uh, Minister, I'm sure you, could, you share my concern about the temporary closure of St Comgill's Primary School in Bangor uh, because of the COVID. Uh, can you assure me that your departmental officials are engaging with the school and offering help and advice as required to ensure the continuing welfare of both the staff and pupils? Thank you. Yeah, uh, and there has been that case and also another case in, in Seoul. In both the cases, we will be working alongside um, the schools. It is the case, I think, it's, uh, while it's maybe wrong to drill too much down into the detail of individual cases, that in both the cases involved do not actually, as far as I'm aware, directly involve uh, the children. It's actually been where there have been, um, in each case, more than one teacher that has been directly involved. That has actually created a, a staffing issue more so than a, a, a teaching issue for the, for the children. So we're working alongside those and I think that I would hope in both cases to see resumption of full school activity um, and working as well not just through the department, through the education authority and as both the schools that have been particularly mentioned, uh, we'd be maintained schools working closely alongside CCMS as well to ensure that we can actually get a resumption of those schools uh, as quickly as possible and certainly within before we reach the point of the 14 days. You know, I'd be hopeful of that that would be the case. It's also the case that in terms of um, the issue of close contact, because as a result of this, a number of teachers were identified as close contact. It is the case where you have close contact, and that is, that is clearly defined. It is principally those who have been within two metres for more than 15 minutes. Now, in any school situation, that may create a situation, there may be exceptional circumstances, it may create a situation where a group of individuals are impacted, or even in some cases it can move as far as, as part or whole of a class. It shouldn't really be the situation unless it's a very small school where it impacts on the entire school. Sometimes those schools may take a precautionary measure following the advice, for instance, to have a deep clean, which would require the, the, the agency, but there shouldn't really be a situation or to only very rare occasions where we see an entire school closed for 14 days, because that would not really fall within the advice that has been given in terms of contacting with public health. But we'll work with schools in individual circumstances. And whatever is put in place, there can always be some level of exception which may require a wider, wider solution. I call Andrew Muir. Um, my question also relates to St Congo's Primary School in Bangor. And I think our first thoughts would be with those who have been diagnosed with the COVID positive test. We're hoping that they have a, a speedy recovery. I thank the Minister for the clarity being given today in relation to the circumstances around that. But what more can be done to improve the communications, to assuage the anxiety and concern amongst parents, pupils and staff around the situation and to avoy full 14-day uh, full fourteen day closures? Well, uh, look, I think in, in relation to that, sometimes schools will need to take very quick decisions and, and instantaneous action. And that might mean taking an initial approach, which is uh, arguably more precaution than, than may then in light of whenever things are looked at uh, uh, beyond what really is d directly required. So I think there's a need for that close coordination between EA, uh, between schools themselves and PHA. But also I know that I think that, that CCMS, for instance, will be trying to give a level of, of reassurance as well. 
and I hope whenever things will become clear. I, I think in the couple of cases that have arisen, it's actually then almost been about a, a certain level of issues around key holders and around chain of command on that basis, because uh, there have been instances where I think uh, the principles, not in, in terms of, um, to be fair, in terms of actually being diagnosed, but in terms of uh, because of close contact with somebody that has been diagnosed, where they've had to self-isolate. So it's actually about trying to minimise that level of disruption. But it will be a very rare occasion where a large number of pupils should be in a position to have to self-isolate for 14 days. And it is where that, uh, that direct contact, I mean, one of the issues which has been raised has been that if somebody is told to self-isolate but is not diagnosed themselves, does, for instance, their sibling have to self-isolate? No, that is one further step removed. So it is about that precautionary measure around those who've got that direct um, contact. And I suppose in the early days, there's been sometimes different interpretations of that. And it is understandable quite often that schools will take an overly precautionary approach at, the, at first instance. And that's why we need to work directly where it, it arises in any particular school. Dr. Steve Aiken for a question. Number three. Right, uh, I thank the member for his question. Uh, as the member would be aware, of course, my department doesn't directly play a role in the administration or operation of the transfer test, including uh, the location. However, I, I would highlight that whereas up until 2016 there was at least memos from the department saying that primary schools were not to be used for, uh, for transfer tests, as, uh, when changes were made in the last administration, memos were sent out which indicated there is no bar to prevent any primary school from hosting the tests. Uh, and that remains the position today. Uh, th that is the case. It is also a matter for both the test providers and for the individual schools. So the current arrangements for holding the tests have been agreed between the test providers and the schools which use the results as part of their admissions criteria. And ultimately, it's the responsibility of the test providers and host schools to ensure that appropriate safety and social distancing are put in place within the test centres uh, wherever they are held, and the chief medical officers and public uh, health advice authority advice is followed. Steve Aiken for a supplementary. May I thank the minister for his uh, uh, comments so far? And as a point of disclosure, as, as you're well know, aware that I am a member of the Board of Governors, and uh, like another honourable member here, I have two young daughters in the school who are going through a similar process as before. But you'd be very glad to know that they have no intention whatsoever of ever going back into politics. Thank goodness for that. But the, real, the question I would like to ask, Minister, is bearing in mind the fact that one of the things that we're being asked time and time again is particularly to maintain the bubbles and the bubbling principle within our primary schools as well. And I do understand the fact that the, prov the provision of the AQE is not through your uh, specific responsibility. However, could you give an indication as that is the area you think that this should be the way we should be approaching this, and indeed by doing that, provide the impetus between the, sort of the schools and the examination bodies themselves to be able to do that? Because I think that is something that would be welcomed by all schools, by all parents, and indeed by children as well. well I'd like to see a situation in which we develop a point, first of all, I think, where there would be common agreement in terms of transfer. I suspect that is unlikely. Um, and also, I think the ideal situation is every child would be able to sit within their own primary school doing that. I think part of the problem will also be not only is, are the tests provided by independent bodies, and therefore we'll have control over that, but if we're to do the tests in a, and I appreciate different members of this House will have different views in terms of the tests, if we do that on a fair and equitable basis, it could only really be done if we get full buy-in from primary schools. Uh, I think that while there are difficulties and additional pressures on children because they're not doing it within their own primary school, I think it would be a less equitable position if some children were able to do it within their own primary schools and others were not, because that doesn't create a level playing field. And again, whatever people's views on the transfer test, it is largely a competitive process between those who are uh, sitting that test because they're trying to obtain particular places in particular schools. So if we ended up with a situation in which uh, for example, 50% of primary schools says, yes, we're happy to do it, and 50% said they weren't. For a child sitting, in one child sitting it in their home primary school, and another sitting it in a different place, I think would not provide that level playing field. So we've also got to bear that, that in mind as well. Thank you, Sir Karen Mullen. For any case, I called Karen Mullen. 
Minister, following the release of today's audit report, um, calling for an urgent review of special education needs, would, it not, would you not be better directing your efforts to the children, those children with special education needs, rather than trying to facilitate this unregulated test during a health pandemic? Well, I mean, first of all, and I expect it may come up uh, as well, I mean, may be able to make very brief comments at some stage on the, the audit report. There is a restriction on what I can say directly on the audit report because it's to be held at a hearing at the PAC, I think on the 15th or 16th of October, and the convention is that there isn't comment passed upon that. What I would say to the member, and look, and I appreciate the member will come from a, probably a very different angle in terms of both selection and transfer tests than I would. It is not simply an either or. You know, as minister, as a department, we will try and do our best to look after children with special educational needs. We will try to look after the broader issue of transfer. We will look after children in terms of their general school career, in terms of youth. You know, there is a very wide spectrum of um, things that we need to do. So it is not a question of concentration on one issue to the exclusion uh, of another. And as such, even in terms of those transferring at P7, there will be those who will do the tests and those that won't. And our role, particularly as a, as a department, will be to try to make sure that that transition and transfer, and what are going to be very difficult uh, days still ahead in terms of in terms of COVID is done as smoothly as, as effectively. So I, I don't see this as being an either or. Call Jim Allister. The transfer would the Minister agree that the best long term solution is to recommission the test as a departmental test? And will he not follow his heart and his head on that? Well I, I'm glad that the member can look into both my heart and my head on that. Um, it's a skill I'm sure he's developed over the years in relation to that. Look, I think if we were to get a, an agreement uh, on transfer, because I, I think th the member raises the issue, and if uh, I think there were two issues in relation to that. First of all, if I was minister simply to go on a solo run and say, here's a DE test, uh, I think that that would be, I suspect, something that would be very quickly called in uh, as a controversial issue into the executive. We need, if there would be something to get that. But also, we need to give people a certain level of long-term certainty. And if we have a situation in which one particular action in terms of a state test is done by one minister, and then a different minister who has a very different view on that simply cancels that, you would be simply throwing people between different, different situations. So, what's that? No, uh, the member... Um, sorry, the member just, just, a moment, uh, just a moment, sorry, okay. Minister. Uh, if members wish to ask questions, they should raise and uh, just please, no comments from a seated position. Look, the member is that the, the issue in terms of we have a power sharing situation. If Sinn Féin, uh, I heard from a sedentary position what he was saying, I think if Sinn Féin had had their way in terms, it's, it's no doubt that they would simply have abolished academic selection and abolished transfer tests completely. But the law is that enables those, those to take place. So it is not a question of entirely freedom to manoeuvre for either. But, you know, there is no point in somebody making a great grandstand on an issue which then risks being a situation where it can simply be overturned at, at a later stage. And it is undoubtedly the case. I would want to see, for instance, a situation in which the two transfer test organisations come together and produce at least a single, uh, a single test. I think that would be something which would ease the burden uh, for parents and for students. But I'm also realistic enough to know to try and get a common agreement across this chamber on selection is not something that is in any way likely to happen. Iram, Sir Pat Catney for your cash. I call Pat Catney for. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and thank the Minister for his answers so far. Question for Minister, please. Thank you, Member. Uh, through, the, through the Education Restart Wellbeing Project, a range of measures are being delivered in direct response to the COVID 19 pandemic to support the well being of staff and pupils. That includes the Education Authority EA online portal of resources uh, available to schools with information on supporting learners, leaders and staff. The EA Youth Service Youth Online resource where children and young people can have access to information, advice and support. The Wellbeing Helpline facilitated by the Education Psychology Service providing support to schools as they respond to a range of need amongst their pupils. Subject to business case approval, there's been £5 million Education Restart Wellbeing Project funding will also be directly allocated to schools very soon. By receiving the allocation, schools will benefit from having the flexibility to use that money 
to provide health and wellbeing support for their pupils and staff and draw down on, on a range of programmes. Also, I suppose I've recently launched the Engage programme, through which 11.2 million has been earmarked to enable all primary and post-primary schools to provide additional teaching support for pupils, uh, particularly for those from disadvantaged backgrounds. And the member, I'm sure, will be well aware that in dealing with this issue, there is funding, if you like, for academic catch-up. There's funding for well-being. But in many ways, I think, within schooling, the two, there's a certain level of the two being inextricably uh, linked. In addition to this specific COVID-19 support, uh, my department is also working collaboratively with the Department of Health, Public Health Agency, the Health and Social Care Board, the EA, and other government departments to develop a framework for children and, and young people's emotional health and well-being in education. Uh, this is progressing well, and we are uh, working to complete the framework by December 2020. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Deputy and thank the Minister for, for that very comprehensive answer, and I welcome that additional funding that's going into it. But given the uh, impact that COVID has had probably on us, on our children, and I hear about the additional resources, um, how soon can that move in order that the teachers, as those first responders, are able to help as quickly as possible? Thanks, Minister. I expected to be signed off very quickly. It's a business case, just, uh, and indeed the money is, is there. It will be able to be applied. I suppose one of the initial elements, um, from both an academic and a well-being point of view, was that even if everything was ready to run from the 1st of September, that probably wouldn't have been the most prudent way to spend that anyway, because I think at individual level within schools, there will need to be a certain level of assessment of where children are. And indeed, it may well be that individual children within um, a particular class will have reacted differently to COVID. So we, we can't just make natural assumptions. But the, there is no doubt uh, that as well as the, a level of um, academic catch-up that is needed, that, that many children will have been impacted adversely, and we move to provide that level of support. I think we're conscious in terms of the uh, business case that has been put forward that that specific amount of money will be able then to be allocated directly into schools where they can then decide on the ground where the best interventions um, should be. Oh, William Humphreys for a supplement. Minister for his answers so far. Uh, welcome the new funding and increased funding that the Minister has mentioned and also around the joint upness that he's uh, explained to the House that is most welcome around this issue which is hugely important and of course a growing issue within our community. Can I just ask the Minister to ensure that we have that joint upness working to its maximum. It's important that the, the Department work not just with schools, but also those organisations working in the community that are specialist organisations, the likes of Extern, for example, uh, Greater Shankill Alternatives um, and Greater Shankill uh, Integrated Services in my area, to, to allow young people who are working with those organisations to be reached also. Would the Minister agree? And I've met um, already, and I'm happy to meet with any other organisations, with a number of, of organisations that have provided direct uh, frontline support uh, within schools, a number of charities and third party organisations. And I think if we were to get the maximum benefit, because as well as the five million that's been allocated in terms of restart, there will also be a programme of an additional six and a half million that will go into mental health and wellbeing uh, within schools. If we're to maximise the value that we get from that, there is both expertise that can be provided by third party organisations. They can also play part of a cocktail in terms of levering in additional resources. Um, and it is actually also, again, about what is being able to deliver on the ground, because also uh, one size will not fit all. If you're talking about a six-year-old in one particular location, 16-year-old in a different location, there will be different responses that will be, will be needed, and indeed potentially sometimes different responses even within the single class. That concludes um, the period for listed questions. We now move to 15 minutes of topical questions, and I call Mr Chris Little. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Further to yet another profoundly concerning report, will the Education Minister take this opportunity to apologise to children and families with special educational needs who his department and arm's length bodies of his department are systemically failing to support? Well, look, I think it's clearly the case that, that where any child has been let down, I'm very sad to see that, that happening. Directly speaking, in terms of the report, I welcome the report because I think it does. Uh, shine a light on what needs to happen and indeed there will be movement fairly soon um, on the issue of the SEN framework. It is the case that in terms of the detail of the report I am restricted by procedure at the moment in terms of 
uh, dealing directly with it, or at least commenting directly on it, as it's due, I think, for the PAC hearing on the 15th of October. And the protocol is that there's no comment um, on the detail of report ahead of that. So that limits the response that, um, they, that I could make. But I think, collectively, I think we need to make sure as we move forward that the best possible services are provided to all our children, particularly those most vulnerable, particularly those from an, uh, who have special educational needs. Supplementary, Chris Little. Well, thank you, Deputy Speaker. A key goal of the Department of Education is to support all children uh, to achieve their potential. Does the Minister not accept that his department has failed to achieve this goal and is failing children and families with special educational needs across Northern Ireland? As I've indicated to the member, in terms of some of the findings of the report, I will have to wait until we get to the thing. So I, you know, I can't be in a full position to answer the, the member, and I'm sure the member knows that uh, full well. There will be very shortly, in terms of trying to advance the issue on special educational needs, launch of consultation on the SEN regulations and framework uh, documents. I believe that is something that, uh, with need for additional level of support as we move ahead, can make a level of change can within any society we do better in terms of the level of support that we provide for SEN? Yes, we can. But that may also mean that for all of us there may be some tough, tough choices to be made in connection with that as well. Question John O'Dowd. Question for John O'Dowd. Jeremy, I'll get last can call you. Minister, the schools are now open, uh, reopened for about a month and they're still waiting to full clarification in terms of changes to the curriculum and the qualifications. And I have to express concern that we're, we're in danger of following the English curriculum. Indeed, an idea of Michael Gove from many years ago that everybody studies Shakespeare. Uh, Shakespeare was okay. He sold a few plays, a few books. He'd done okay. But we have Joyce Wilde back at Behan and Heaney as, as an example of the curriculum materials our schools could be using. Can the Minister assure the Chamber that we are going to follow a curriculum that enriches our lo young children from all sectors of society, whether it's Shakespeare or Heaney? Uh, Shakespeare me thinks the member doth protest too much in relation to this. Um, look, we, we are in a position that, in, in terms of that, there's been particular uh, advice at a level that's been drawn up by CCEA. Actually, as we speak, I understand that in terms of both in terms of examinations and also the curriculum, uh, there's been engagement this morning, for instance, with trade union sectors. So we are reaching actually a fairly close point, and I think at, literally as we speak. Uh, a group of stakeholders in terms of school principals are being consulted by our officials on what CCA have brought forward. That will, that will enable, I think, probably later on this week, final positions in terms of curriculum to be brought forward uh, to, uh, to myself then for either agreement, amendment or change. So I think this will be an issue that will move on very quickly. I think it is important uh, that all actions are taken that will be fully to the benefit of all our pupils in Northern Ireland. And that, means, that might mean at times that we uh, we can diverge, but we've also got to make sure that there is a level of portability with our, our qualifications. The key element with any of our qualifications is to make sure that no student in Northern Ireland is, is disadvantaged. Uh, and so I think the curriculum will have to reflect some of the changed circumstances that, that are there. And I hope to be in a position that that, that will become very clear very soon. Okay, Storleen Taki, John O'Dowd, supplementary for John O'Dowd. I am in danger of maybe misquoting, but I, I think it was Beckett who said education is the lighting of a fire, not the filling of a bucket. And so the Minister, I, I welcome the fact that the Minister is in using materials from across, or hoping to use materials across the board. But it is important. And the, we, we have our local curriculum, which has served our pupils very well. Everything is open to revision, everything is open to review. But it's important that you, as our Minister, deliver a curriculum which meets the needs of our children. I don't disagree with the, the member. We may, um, I think maybe I should probably like end before we actually start simply quoting at each other in, in terms of uh, literary sources that are, uh, we have a rich tapestry of, of, of literary sources that, that can be from across various jurisdictions on that basis. You know, it is the case uh, that in terms of curriculum, that I think the role of any minister is to set the broad direction in terms of curriculum, set the parameters that are there in terms of examination. So, for example, um, if there's opportunities to say that given current circumstances, there can be particular um, relaxation to the way the courses work to allow uh, that we can't necessarily expect uh, every student to study the, the full content of what would, would, have, would have been there given the level of disruption in terms of normal years. But I'm also conscious that in terms of the uh, detail, and we've seen this happen in, in various jurisdictions, where we've seen ministers intervening to say you should be studying particularly X or Y 
or almost um, which has a certain type of big brother type quality to say so and so is a um, preferred writer, so and so is to be uh, to be banned. You know, it's uh, we're not sort of in the, the, the world of sort of banning Boris Pasternak, for instance, as would have happened in the, the old Soviet Union on that basis. So I think that there's also going to be a level of professional judgment on the detail of what's there in terms of the curriculum as well. And that I don't think any, I think it's, and I know the member didn't try to do this when he was minister, that it's not really the role of a minister to micromanage that, that either, but to give that broad opportunity that, that is there. And I think giving the, the wide range of options, and I think the fact that our curriculum is less prescriptive sometimes than others, I think works well in our benefit. And you're right in terms of, I think, that the, uh, broadly speaking, the curriculum does serve our, our pupils well in Northern Ireland. Oh, Paula Bradshaw. Deputy Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for your letter this morning um, outlining your department's engagement with St Joseph's College and my constituency um, and its, around its campaign for a new build. Can I ask if the protocol for selection of major works projects to proceed in planning financial year 2021 has been released, or will you be using the same one from 2019-20? Thank you. Uh, no, um, the protocol, what I've, what I've indicated, which gives a little bit of flexibility in terms of exact timing, when there will be a new call for major works, uh, I've indicated that will happen during 2021. Now, that is not necessarily prescriptive that will happen before the 1st of April 2021, but it will happen during the calendar year of, of, of 2021, I think. The sooner we can get that, the better. I've indicated uh, that I want to look at the, the protocol that is there, because while I think there was a, an important um, merit in being able to facilitate where amalgamations were taking place, where I think it did leave, and St. Joseph would be a good example, but there, I'm sure everyone can raise um, schools from within their own constituency. One of the problems was that a, a large number of schools with very poor, inadequate physical infrastructure, while those were part of the, the points scored, in some cases were then overtaken by schools that, that got levels point for amalgamation. I think that's unfair in those, those schools. So I, I've indicated on a number of occasions that I want to look at the protocol, and the particularly as regards the issue of the scoring mechanism for amalgamations, that either that shouldn't form part of an, a new call, or alternatively, that perhaps it is something that is uh, reduced in terms of its scope. Bradshaw for supplementary. Um, thank you. Minister, you'll also be aware that in the South Belfast constituency over the next few years, there will probably be about 800 to 1,000 new homes, primarily in the Castlereagh South area. I'm just wondering where you are around area planning for post-primary provision there. Thank you. Well, broadly speaking, the area planning process is being stood up again. It was during a period of the, um, of the pandemic. Uh, we had to look, I suppose, at all aspects within the department, in particular from a policy point of view, of what was if you like, something that had to happen immediately, or indeed also issues around where um, uh, there would be difficulty, if you like, simply moving ahead with, with processes, because area planning by its nature quite often will involve a wide range of consultation, a range of meetings. That was not particularly appropriate during the pandemic. While the pandemic is still very much with us, uh, there is a desire then to uh, start to reboot things as regards uh, area planning. And so the wider strategic area planning group um, is due to have its first reconvened meeting in later October. Um, the individual, they will look, if you like, at the, try to look holistically at the, the best needs of, of an overall area. Obviously, within that, that may well lead to development proposals, which in themselves as individual proposals would, from a legal point of view, would need to be looked at separately by myself. So there's maybe a limited amount I can try and prejudge particular areas. But, uh, you know, I think it is clear that we do need to ensure that what provision is there um, reflects the broader demographics and the, bro the broader needs in terms of our young people uh, of an area. Um, Mr. Bradley isn't in his place, so therefore, Aram Sir Mark Durkin, for your case to call Mark Durkin. I thank the Minister for his answers th thus far. I had read a, a news report last week, and it's on the subject of the transfer test. Can the Minister give clarity on whether those schools who took the wise and brave decision, in my opinion, to opt out of the transfer test this year? And I think of St Columns and Thornhill in my own constituency, will be required to go through the development proposal process? I think there has been, due to correspondence we've received, the department has, uh, has sought sort of legal advice on whether that is something that is necessary, and I suppose we're still waiting for a final uh, position on that. Thank you, Minister, and I'm sure we all look forward to, to, to seeing the outcome of that, because 
I would ask the Minister if he recognises the potential chaos that this situation would cause for schools and the massive stress that it could potentially cause for children. I understand. I think people need to be given as much certainty as possible. Schools do have a level of entitlement to decide what methodology they use uh, within the bounds of, of legal authority as to um, what selection criteria and how they order um, how, how that would be. Obviously, any school will need to operate within the boundaries of what their levels of legal competence. And I suppose I, I don't want to prejudge any um, legal information that is received. Uh, clearly, that will determine whether that counts as a level of significant change that would require a development proposal um, in connection uh, with that. And Dr. Kiva Archibald, when you cash, uh, Dr. Kiva Archibald, for a question. Um, Gur Margaret, uh, last can call you. Can I ask the minister if he's considered how to implement paragraph 86D of the CEDAW report as required under the Executive Formation Act 2019? Uh, well, in terms of the detail of that, I think we're working with organisations in, in relation to that now. Uh, as I don't have 86D directly um, in front of me, um, I maybe sort of maybe can write with more information directly to uh, the, uh, the member. I presume is this in relation to RSE in connection with that. What I would say is I think that in terms of the direct detail of where we would tend to differ probably from other jurisdictions, that in terms of levels of provision and indeed what is specifically in the curriculum. Um, we don't try and micromanage the curriculum. Materials will be provided, but schools will have a level of authority in line with their ethos as to what directly is, is there within the, uh, within the curriculum. So we don't try to impose within the, the curriculum as much as possible. Paragraph 86D says make age appropriate, comprehensive and scientifically accurate educational and sexual and reproductive health and rights a compulsory component of curriculum for adolescents co covering prevention of early pregnancy and access to abortion and monitor its implementation. So how does that match up then with schools having the, the ability under their ethos to monitor what they teach? I'm making in relation to that is that we don't have, in the vast bulk of areas we know now, a compulsory curriculum. We have a range of options which schools can go down. So I'm conscious, I suppose, also uh, of where there is any level of conflict that would take place between the legal permissibility of schools and any legislation uh, as well. Obviously, um, this was legislation which was passed at Westminster uh, and not by this, this House. So I think that will also be something we need to, to bear in mind what the level of flexibility that will be there for schools. Members, time is up, and uh, I would invite members to just take their ease while we change the top table, please.